24, 36 through 48. The disciples were still talking about this when Jesus suddenly stood among them. He said, may peace be with you. They were surprised and terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is really I. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a body or bones, but you can see that I do. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his feet. But they still not, did not believe it. They were amazed and filled with joy. So Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of cooked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything written about me must happen. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must come true. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer. He will rise from the dead on the third day. His followers will preach in his name. They will tell others to turn away from their sins and be forgiven. People from every nation will hear it, beginning at Jerusalem. You have seen these things with your own eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Before I begin this morning, I do want to give God all the praise and glory for allowing me this opportunity to stand in front of you and bring His word. Please join me in prayer. Most holy God, we thank you and we praise you for blessing us with this place to come and worship you through the songs that we sing the words that we speak, and the acts of kindness we extend to each other in your name. <clears throat> Throughout this Easter season, we continue to thank you for sending your Son, who while we were yet sinners, suffered and died for us, so that we may be forgiven. I pray that we never take this wonderful act of grace for granted. As we now turn our attention to your word, I pray that you will help us quiet our minds and open our hearts as your Holy Spirit descends upon us this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now the passage for this week is Luke's story of what happened that first Easter evening. And it's the third story that gets told in this particular chapter of Luke. Now I'm going to break down the other two real quickly for you. So that you can have some context for what happens in today's passage. The first story that's told is in this chapter is about the women. They find the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. Then when they go inside, two angels appear to them and say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Now remembering what Jesus said about being raised from the dead, they rush back to the disciples and share their story. The disciples heard their story, and they decided that it sounded like nonsense. So they didn't believe the second story is about two believers who walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They knew Jesus before he was crucified, but they didn't recognize him on this particular day. Not until they sat down to the evening meal and he broke bread with them. And then their eyes were opened and they saw who Jesus was. And in the same instant, he disappeared. 
Now they rush back to the disciples and they share their story as well. Now when we pick up today's reading, the disciples were talking about what happened on the road to Emmaus. Now presumably, they were trying to decide whether to believe the story of the two who claimed to have walked most of the day with Jesus. Remember, they had just decided that the women's story sounded like nonsense. But as they were in the midst of their deliberations, Jesus appeared to them. And he said, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. In our passage, Luke goes to great lengths to assure the disciples, and also us, as the people who hear the gospel, that this is no ghost. This is no illusion. It's really Jesus standing there. Look at my hands and feet, he said. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and blood, blood as you see that I have. Jesus even eats with the disciples. Or rather, he eats while they sit there stunned trying to figure out what's going on. When you take these stories together, Luke does a masterful job of communicating the truth of the resurrection. The risen Christ may be outside of our understanding, but he is real. It's the same Jesus but in a different form. It's the same person the disciples dedicated their lives to following with a different picture of what life could be. It's the same one they knew, but now they didn't know what to expect. The one they thought was the Messiah had been crucified. But now the categories they'd always known didn't work because he was also standing in front of them as flesh and blood talking, touching, and even eating. It's amazing what happens when we have an experience that challenges our perspective on how things should be. Now, a little while ago, I saw a YouTube video that, that I'll show you in just a moment. It's a segment of a show called Britain's Got Talent. It's sort of the British version of our American Idol. Now, watch as a young man and woman walk out on the stage. She may pass as someone looking like the typical pop star, but certainly not him. As the cameras pan the crowd, it's obvious that they're not going to give them a chance. They were hardly worth their time, except maybe for a good laugh. Now, if we could have someone dim the lights, please. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good, nice to meet you. Uh, what's the act called? Uh, Charlotte and Jonathan. Charlotte and Jonathan. Okay. Um, and how old are you both? I'm 16. I'm 17. Okay. Um, and, and you thought the combination would work. Whose idea was it? Um, it was our singing teachers, actually. She thought it would be good to try us out together. <laughs> and we both sounded quite good when we sang what we did. Okay, you're not saying much, Jonathan. <laughs> Are you shy? Uh, sometimes. I've always had sort of problems with my size since like, I can remember. And when I was in sort of primary school, it was back then really that I had sort of the mick taken out of me and it, it kind of damaged my confidence quite a bit. When, when people would say something to me, I'd just, it'd just take a little piece out of me in a sense. I'm quite protective of Jonathan, like, if someone, if I was there and someone stood there and said something to him, I wouldn't sit, I couldn't sit there with my mouth shut. Before you make a judgement on someone, I think you really need to get to know them, it's not, it's cliche, it's not judging a book by its cover, you've got, you've got to read what's inside. Charlotte's been a really big help for me in terms of confidence and making me a better performer and I really don't think I'd be going up on stage today if I didn't have Charlotte on my side. And do you think you could win? Yeah, together. Alright, good luck. Thank you. Thank you.
know about you, but I was moved when I watched that video. It didn't seem to go together. I mean, the reality TV show, this overweight, painfully shy, 17-year-old young man, and that tremendous voice. The categories that the crowd knew didn't work anymore. And you know what happened? Well, Jonathan left the stage. The same person who walked out there. Young, overweight, and painfully shy. But the crowd, the people who heard him sing, underwent a transformation. Their perspective had been changed. Because they now had eyes to see the beauty that they weren't able to see before. And apparently it was enough to make them want to tell others about it. Jonathan is the buzz online. People started talking. People started paying attention. And it's everywhere. Millions have viewed that YouTube video. I actually don't know much about Jonathan. But I do know that it started because he didn't fit into the categories that people expected. When something affects us or challenges our thinking, it changes us. As Jesus stood with the disciples that evening, our passage tells us he opened their minds to understand the scripture. He called them witnesses of the life, the death, and now the resurrection of the Messiah. And though he didn't use the imperative, he was clear when he told them to proclaim repentance and forgiveness to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And instead of hiding out in the rooms, they did proclaim it. It seems like our actions are always based on experience, and their ability to witness dependent on their encounter with the risen Christ. What had before been a faith where everyone who believed were drawn towards Jerusalem as the center of the world. Because it was a place where the temple was. And therefore a place where God lived. Now it was to be a faith where God wasn't bound by the temple. God wasn't bound by the tomb. God could walk unrecognized with people most of the day. Or God could stand in flesh and blood, talking, touching, and eating with his disciples. There was a change of perspective. Jesus didn't fit their preconceived categories. And the disciples were to be witnesses, carrying the message, carrying the story out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. That's the commission Jesus gave to his disciples. And by extension, it's a commission he's given to us. You are witnesses of these things, he said. Tell the story. Not as hearsay or as secondhand knowledge, but out of experience of the difference that faith has made in your lives. The difference a relationship with God has made in your life. We are asked to tell the story with words, when and if we can, but also we're asked to witness to the love of Christ simply by the way we act, by the way we live our lives. And I love the way Peter expresses it in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised <coughs> through Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing is, that it's not only a commission, it's a blessing. It's a blessing because our Savior is risen. Hallelujah! Christ has risen. When we live as witness, going out from the center, sharing the story in grand or small ways, when we live as witnesses, our eyes are open. We see the way God works in the world. And we come to know the risen Christ even better. 
Yes, God did a totally new thing in the resurrection. When God appeared to his disciples and stood outside their categories of understanding, he forever changed their perspective of what life could be. But God didn't stop there. God is still doing something new each time we experience the risen Christ in our lives. And these experiences enrich the story we have to tell. We are drawn to live the story. We're drawn to tell the story, to share that story. Our witness overflows. Hallelujah! Christ has risen. It's a positive feedback loop. It's a self-reinforcing cycle. Not only a commission, but a blessing. Our perspective has been forever changed. You are witnesses of these things. Now go. Be witnesses. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for these words. They have helped us to remember the resurrection of your Son as our Savior. And in some small way, experience it through the lives of those who lived it. Father, I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes so that like those who first witnessed your Son's resurrection, our perspective will be forever changed so that we may truly believe in the risen Christ, and that we may be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we can boldly proclaim your glory through everything that we say and do. Let us be your witnesses to the world. We pray this in the name of your Son, the risen Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.